We're going to be thinking about the Sabbath for the next six weeks. And um, the story of the Sabbath comes from the Jewish people. The Jewish people that through Joseph ended up in the famine in Egypt. And then for many years they grew as a people in Egypt. And then a pharaoh came along who did not know or remember Joseph. And so the people became a people who were put into slavery. And then Moses comes on behalf of God because God has heard the cry of his people and he leads them out of slavery into the wilderness and at Mount Sinai Moses goes up the mountain and he hears the ten commandments from God or literally the ten words. Think of all the papers that you have in your company as a governor at your school. God says to lead a people who will be a light to the nations I'm going to give you ten words. There's a brevity and a freshness about what God gives us. And one of those words is this that we read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. It's the longest, longest of the ten words. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. My first church was in Bexhill-on-Sea, which has the third highest elderly population in Europe, behind a town in Holland and then Worthing, that's just along the coast from Bexhill. And 38% of our church members, we had over 300 at that time, were over the age of 85, I think it was. So we had a very mature congregation in many ways, and they were a great and affirming group for Joe and I in marriage and for me um, getting used to being a Baptist minister. But I do remember that some of them would come up to me sometimes after church and say, on a Sunday, the Sabbath, we shouldn't do anything. And it would be really aggressive with their walking stick there and their finger pointed at me there. And I'd say, nothing. They'd say, yes, nothing. I'd say, so you don't read a newspaper on a Monday then? Yes, I do. But someone has to work on a Sunday to make your paper from under. I was a lot cheekier in those days than I am now. Oh, well, well, that's different. And if your husband slips in the bath on a Sunday, will you call the ambulance from the Conquest Hospital to come in? Oh, well, yes, of course. So you expect people driving the ambulances to work. When they get to the hospital, do they just leave them there till Monday in the well? No, 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 no. And I said, oh, what about me? Do you want me to rest on a Sunday? I could see in their minds the thing where it looks like you do anyway, from the, <laughs> the quality of the sermons we get. And it just brought up the complexity, at a very simple level, of the Sabbath. We're going to look at Sabbath for six weeks. It's based around some Old Testament passages that we're going to look at, and this book, which is by Walter Brueggemann. Um, and it's called Sabbath as Resistance, saying no to the culture of now. I read this book about five or six years ago, and as I sat reading it in two evenings, it's a short book with a large font, so you can seem really intelligent. I thought, this has got depth, but I think it speaks to our culture now. And I planned this sermon series for just as we were entering COVID, because I plan a sermon series in September for the January to December of the next year, and there's flexibility in there as the Holy Spirit leads us, but I find I'm more creative if I plan better. And as COVID started, I thought, I don't think I can do this sermon series online. I remember we preached on Sabbath at my last church in Seven Oaks, and I asked Charlie Ingram to do it, the assistant associate minister. And he said, why do you always give me the tough passages? And I say, because I'm the lead minister. <laughs> and I love you. It will help you grow. <laughs> and I remember him preaching on Sabbath, and there was a woman, about 40, two, three young kids, and as he was preaching on taking a day's rest, literally it looked like steam was coming out of her ears. I thought if I'd have invited as a prayer response, anyone can come up the front and batter Charlie with their Bible, that she would have been at the front of the queue, hefting it over him, 
telling him he didn't know what he was going on about. And so I didn't want to do this sermon series online. I wanted to be able to talk to you face to face, although some of you are watching online and you're welcome, so that I could see the irritation in you as the weeks grow, potentially. I didn't want to be a wimp, and I'm being serious about this. Because this is a series that I think, if it doesn't challenge you, it certainly has, has and is challenging me. In the book Sabbath as Resistance, Walter Brueggemann that you see there, a man in his late 80s who's written over 100 books on the Old Testament, is acknowledged as the guru on the Old Testament in the Western church, says this. For the most part, contemporary Christians pay little attention to the Sabbath we more or less know that the day came to reflect in US culture, and I would suggest in the UK as well, the most stringent disciplinary faith of the Puritans, which in recent time translated into a moralistic prescription for a day of quiet restraint and prohibition. In many somewhat pietistic homes, that amounted to not playing cards or seeing films on Sunday and certainly not shopping. I can remember each year debates in our rural community about farmers working on some few Sundays to harvest wheat in the face of devastating rains that were sure to come. Some of all these memories of restraint was essentially negative, a series of thou shalt nots that served to echo the more fundamental prohibitions of the Decalogue. The Decalogue is the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. This context did not offer more potential for seeing the Sabbath in a positive way as an affirmative declaration of faith and or identity. And of course, as church monopoly in our culture has in many places waned or disappeared, the commitment to Sabbath discipline has likewise receded. The Sabbath, the fourth commandment, is in the context of the first commandment, Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3. Moses up the mountain and it says this, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, gods with a small g, gods like Pharaoh who ruled over them, who was hard-nosed and told them that they would work and work and work, a system where there was no rest a system and a culture that was about slavery. We will get every last ounce out of you in this profit-making culture called Egypt. So work until you drop dead. If you grew up in that culture for 400 years, it's pretty hard to shake. If you grew up in a family, if I grew up in a family where it was work, 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 from preschool and play school to junior and infant school to senior school to university or full-time employment or whatever it was, and you were always told that you could do better, not in a positive way, but in a, where your sister did better, your brother's better than you at this, that, and the other, and you always felt, I wasn't quite doing it. And the pharaohs of our lives in many cases trying to be loving, unlike the pharaoh of Egypt, just put brick upon straw brick upon dry straw brick upon our shoulders and we never quite got out from under it. We see, and I'm not going to read it, but you can if you want to, in Exodus 5 verses 4 to 19, when Moses and Aaron, his brother, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, he basically says, who's going to do my work? I need bricks built from my buildings and they work free of charge seven days a week. So if they're not going to work, I'm going to give them less straw so they find it harder to work so they know what the real life is like. You ever had a boss like that? When you just say, can I just leave early? Or can I maybe lay down that part of my job? Well, I'll show you how tough it is if you think it's tough now in a way to drive you down or out. The Jewish people, before they receive these ten commandments, these ten words, have come out of this Egyptian slavery. And they're in the wilderness learning how to live as a community with and before God. How do we live as a people when we've been told that we're not human beings, we're human doings? 
Moses tells them. When the Sabbath starts on a Friday at 6 p.m., we stop. We worship God. Have you seen that film, Schindler's List? Absolutely horrific. The most powerful part for me, or one of them, is when the Jews in the concentration camps light the candles to observe Sabbath in a place where God seems absent. But they still say, as the bodies pile up and the gas chambers are filled, we will observe the Sabbath. We will stop. And we will stop until 6 p.m. on Saturday. We will simplify our lives. Walter Brueggemann says, the Sabbath is a sphere of inaction. Michael Fishbane says, a maintenance of Jewish mindfulness in a society that is increasingly mindless is what the Sabbath is about. In the midst of all the busyness, let's stop and let's reflect on who God is and what God has done for us and through us. And that through us is important as well. Uh, how often do we do things for God and God blesses us and uses us and we're just on to the next thing straight away? I think we have a whiff of that culture here at TBC and as a staff team we're trying to rectify that and saying let's celebrate when God does good things through us. But if we're always busy and we never have a Sabbath where we stop, then we can't reflect back on all the good things God has done. Stop. Walter Brueggemann says, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is an act of trust in the subversive exodus-causing God of the first commandment, an act of submission to the restful God of commandments one, two, and three. Sabbath is a practical divestment so that neighborly engagement rather than production and consumption defines our lives. It is for good reason that Sabbath has long been, for theologically serious Jews, the defining disciplines. It is also for good reason that Enlightenment-based autonomous Christians may find the Sabbath commandment the most urgent and most difficult of all the commandments of Sinai. We are liberals and conservatives, much inured, that means familiarised, to Pharaoh's system. We know Pharaoh's system of work, work, work. For that reason, the departure into restfulness is both urgent and difficult, for our motors are set to run at brick-making speed. To cease, even for a time, the anxious striving for more bricks is to find ourselves with a lightened burden and an easy yoke. Jesus says to us, come and live with me and find rest. To the huge crowd in Matthew 11, as they look at him, weighed down by religious obligations that had flowed out of the ten words, the ten commandments, Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. This passage is my life passage. This is my anchor text. This is what I come back to. This is what I pray on the way home from school after dropping Amos at Woodland School. Jesus, I come to you and you give me rest. Why? Because my line of work is one where overwork and burnout is almost glorified. It has been for decades. We've taken the Protestant work ethic where we work really hard for God and God has been taken out of it in our culture but we still work really hard for no one. And it's true for Baptist ministers that we're glorified in it. Make sure your desk is messy enough that you look really busy but organised enough that you're in control of it. Make sure when, in fact, people say to me, Neil, I know you're busy, but could I meet you? They don't even allow me to say, no, I'm not. Neil, I know you're busy, but 
Do they say that to you in your life as well? Jeff, Steve, Trina, Rachel, I know you're busy, but... Because we've accepted that this is the culture we will live in. At brick-making speed. And Jesus said to all of us, come to me if you're weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. Not bricks. Rest. This commandment of the Sabbath is a bridge. It's a bridge to the first three commandments that are about following the God who rests and the last six commandments about living with our neighbours and helping them rest. How can I worship a God of rest if I don't sometimes down tools? And how can I be helpful to my neighbours in their rest if I don't sometimes down tools? I can't. The greatest of the commandments, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your mind and love your neighbour as you love yourself. I love myself if I sometimes rest. Stop making bricks. The God who rests will have no rival. He says, I have brought you out of the land of slavery, out of that corrupt work system, and I have brought you away from the gods of Egypt. Mentioning Egypt places this command in a geographical reality. You are not to be going at the rhythm and the speed and the pace of Egypt or the UK or Tunbridge. I am your God. And I command you to rest. The first commandment is a declaration that God is like no God the Jews have followed before. That God will say to them, I am a God of love and mercy and faithfulness. And I have done all for you so that you can follow me. There's a man in a beautiful sunny place and he owned a fishing boat and he went fishing and a guy who was on holiday there, uh, watched him for a few days, and then he went up to him and he went, um, how many fish do you catch a day? He went, oh, I catch about 100 on a good day. How much do you sell them for? And he told him, he said, how much profit? He told him how much profit. And he said, you know, if you went out longer on that day, you could catch more fish. And he went, well, why would I want to do that? And he went, well, then you can sell more fish and get a bigger profit. Well, why would I want to do that? He said, as he laid there sipping his drink. He said, because then you could buy a second boat and then you could hire someone to run that second boat for you. Then you could have two boats that go out longer and you could get more fish and you could make more profit. And then you could buy four boats and then you could do it even more and even more and even more. He went, why would I want to do that? He said, well, then you'll be able to sit down and relax more. He said, what, like I'm doing now? Eugene Peterson, one of my heroes of the faith, who died a couple of years ago, an American minister who wrote many books, he wrote about the Sabbath. And he and his wife said for them, Sabbath looked like this. They made a simple lunch the night before. They got up in the morning. They read a psalm together. And then they would walk for two or three hours in the countryside without saying a word to one another, listening to God, sit down, eat that food, and say how they'd heard God speak to them. And then they would go back and sit down. I shared this at a minister's meeting that we had. And one of the ministers there said, I can think of nothing worse than doing that. That sounds like hell. He said, Sabbath for me is going out to the shed with my son, who's an older teenager, and building a go-kart together. A really complicated, complex one that we spend time doing together. Eugene Peterson said, Sabbath, as he reads it in the Old and the New Testament, is simply this. It's pray and play. It's pray that we are centred on God in everything we do in that day, but it's also play because God is creative. What gives you that creative connection with God? For me, one of the things is oil painting. I don't know how it works, but when I paint, I lose myself with God. I'm not that good at it. 
I did a painting a while back and Joe was in it and she said, oh, you've painted me like a Lego figure. And I thought, well, that wasn't my intention, but now that I step back and look at it, you do kind of look like you should be in a Lego movie. <laughs> but I loved it because I connected with God. It's pray and play. We could go out of here this morning feeling really guilty. Um, most of us might feel that way, that I don't spend a whole day stopping. We can beat ourselves up about that, or we could think, I'm going to take a step towards that. I'm going to have one evening in the week where I don't work. That might be your step towards Sabbath. I'm going to have one part of one day at the weekend, a morning, an afternoon, or an evening, where I am intentionally present for God, my family, my neighbours. Just one small step. Rather than feeling guilty that we can't do the whole day. Because my experience is, and talking to others, when we take that little bit, we want more. Because you think, actually, that was good for me. That was good for my family. That was good for my neighbours. That was good for my relationship with God. Rather than that two hours, if I could break that up to three hours, four hours, five, a day. And please don't look at me and think, I've got it all together. I haven't. It's something I struggle with regularly as a man who's almost 50 with a lovely wife and four children. It's tough. It's a challenge. But God calls us to it. Why? Because God wants relationship, not rocks. God wants relationship with us, not the bricks we make. The bricks can come out of the relationship in a good, steady way. But God wants to pray and play with us. I play football on a Monday night. I'm the oldest there by at least 15 years, and they remind me of it regularly. And we thought we might play a game on a Saturday. And we put in our WhatsApp group, who's up for playing an 11 side game on Saturday? And one of the players came back and said, oh, I can't, it's Sabbath. I thought, how refreshing. And I chatted to him and he said, as a family, we just wanted to simplify life. And this is one of the decisions we've made, that Saturday for us is Sabbath. If you could play on Friday or Sunday, I'd be up for it. But I won't do Saturday. Let's pray together. Let's pray. As we pause for a moment, can I encourage you to think, what's the one step that would be good for me for my family, for my neighbours to take so that I can have that rest, that Sabbath where I can pray and play. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you at some point today, if you have time, to talk to the people that it will affect about the break that you want to take. Because if you're at all like me, I can make decisions in a building or on a couch at home about what I'm going to do, and then it drifts into the busyness of the week if I don't address it straight away. So when you get home over lunch or maybe later this evening when you've got a bit of space, say to the people that you need to, look, I, I want to build this into my life and I think this is what it looks like. How does that work for us as a family or a neighbourhood? And begin that discussion.